And we're back in Inside the Ropes, and this week we have a friend of the show, he's been on before, he is one of the nicest guys I've ever met from professional wrestling, um, and he's still a fan after all these years as well, which is always great to hear, he was part of the original ECW, he pinned John Bradshaw Layfield, as deservedly so, um, in 2005 in the WWE, he is the one and only Blue Mini. Me, welcome back. It's all a charade. All oh, this nice guy stuff is just complete crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, man, thanks for having me back on. I- you're you're quite uh, active on Twitter as well, so I'm going to give you a quick plug now. Um, so you're yep. at the Blue Mini, which is T H double E Blue Mini. Um, if you want to find you, but I, I, you you know you put out mini facts and stuff, and I'm going to read this one out. And I want <laughs> no one I'm going to read out. But um, go ahead. You, earlier today, you put out a mini fact um, about something that happened on October the twenty seventh, nineteen ninety, <laughs> at six forty five p.m. Fifteen minutes before WCW Halloween Havoc. Would you Would you care to elaborate about that? Yeah, on uh, October twenty seventh, nineteen ninety, at. Uh, 6.45 p.m., I lost my virginity, and I know that because it was 15 minutes before WCW Halloween Havoc, and I had to hurry up so I didn't want to miss the pay-per-view. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's weird to how you remember things in life, you know. I remember things, you know, from, like, wrestling events or, you know. So dedicated to wrestling that you let your, <laughs> you let your first... Your first girl get away so you can get to see a WCW pay per view. That's dedication. It's a hell of a dark match. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, yeah a hell of a dark match. I mean, but there's nothing like ruining your virginity than you know, finishing up to a Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich ring entrance. So I mean, you know, that that could, that could do some long term damage. And I love with Tommy Rich and Ricky Morton. They were instrumental in my career, but. Uh, and that, that's not the time I need to see him. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try <laughs> yeah. to move that image from my head. Um, <laughs> but we we did have a... I, I put a thing out on Facebook um, saying that you were coming on the show, and we had some, some listener questions that were quite cool. Because obviously we had you on before, and we kind of covered quite a bit of your career before, so we kind of didn't want to yeah. just go over the same ground as we did before. So um, Mick Wishart, one of our listeners, he wants to know what the experience was like during your run as Gold Dust Ally. So... I guess, like, do you have any memories of that that particular run? It was awesome, man. Um, you know, obviously I got to do Blue Dust in WWE, but before I did WWE, I did, did it in ECW. And I came up from, uh, we were at an ECW show in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, and uh, Paulie pulled me aside. And uh, Goldust had just done the uh, naked promo where he's, he's laying there naked cover just by the uh, Intercontinental belt. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said they wanted me to do that, you know, because, you know, Raven was looking for the dirtiest, gankiest woman in all of the world, you know, for ECW. And he sent Stevie on this scavenger hunt for hoochies and whatever. And uh, they did the promo where I was naked in the park. You know, I brought you the dirtiest, nastiest, gankiest woman. I give you blue dust. And I did the whole, I, you know, blue dust promo naked in the park, which I almost got arrested for. But uh, yeah, two seconds after we were done, the two seconds after we were done, the cops show up and they uh, they just sh- shot me a uh, big spotlight and on my big white oatmeal looking ass. And then, you know, instead of just covering up, I jumped up like Chris Farley, They're like, oh, you know, just I am like the. I'm like the real life Peter Griffin, you know. Just but uh, long story short, uh, I know I'm babbling, but uh, I go to WWE. And I, I went to Vince Russo. I was like, hey man, uh, I saw these guys, you know, stole. They did the angle where uh, Golda stole Al's head. I was like, look man, I used to do uh, a parody of Golda in ECW as Blue Dust. What if I did, uh, you know, the thing of a, of a mind game back to Golda as Blue Dust? And he, you know, kind of smiled and nodded his head. He's like, yeah, that, that sounds like an idea. And, you know, shortly after that, you know, they came up with the idea. And uh, even when I met, like, even before I went to WWE, I met Goldust. And, you know, we were on the show. I was like, hey, man, I uh, hope you don't mind me doing a parody of you. He's like, oh, man, why would I care? You know, uh, you know imitation is a serious, serious form of flattery and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, well, thank you very much. And then we got, you know, I, I got to WWE. I'm getting to do a parody versus him, 
Uh, it was very cool, man. He was very open about it. He was very welcoming. I mean, about it. Sooner, you know, soon after that, they, you know, they broke me off from the job squad, and now I was kind of in limbo. And they kind of, you know, started pairing me and uh, and Goldust up. And you know, Dustin is one of the greatest guys I've ever worked with. I couldn't be happier for him, and uh, I couldn't be happier that he allowed me into his world. So yeah, no, that was very cool, and, and yeah, like he, he's back on TV now as well. But somebody else who's on uh, WWE TV, and I don't really think I got to ask you this the last time, but obviously Paul Heyman is <laughs> someone you're very familiar with, and he's been back in the WWE for about just over a year now. And um, yeah, for, for me personally, um, there's been times in the last twelve months, fifteen months, where I've not been that excited about the program. But I watch because I know Paul Heyman's going to be on it, and he, because he's that good. Do you, as someone who knew him, did you ever think he would go back after he'd left in 2006? Did you ever think he was going to go back there? If you told me he went back, I wouldn't have been shocked. Just because I know he loved the business, you know. But you know, just like anything, you know, sometimes you just need a break. You know, sometimes you just need to step away. I mean, wrestling has been a part. Of, wrestling had been a part of his life for almost. More than half of his life. You know, he started off as a photographer, then a manager, and then, you know, he went, you know, did ECW, and then after ECW, he went right into the WWE. So he never really had a chance to just sit, sit back and go, you know, and catch his breath. You yeah. know, he was always, he was always doing something. You know, sometimes you need to step away from something to really appreciate it. You know, it's kind of like what I say, you know, with, you know, like a like a John Cena too. You know where you know people like to hate on him, but you know, it, and it's no fault of his. But it's not like you know, it's not like the olden days where you know somebody can work WWE and then you know jump ship to another promotion and become fresh in somewhere else. Where if if you're in the WWE, you're just in the WWE, and you see people see it so much that they never really get to get to really appreciate it until you know. You know, you step away. Sometimes you, you know, at, you know, like the term absent makes absence makes the heart grow fonder. I, I guarantee, you know, Cena's been out for a couple months. But I guarantee the next time his music hits, all the people that are like, oh, I'm tired of John Cena, they'll probably pop. And then getting back to Paul Lee, you know, I'm sure in the back of his mind, he, you know, you know, he started. You know, the longer he was away, the more. It probably started, you know, tapping him on the shoulder and saying, "Hey, why don't you come back on over here?" And uh, when you're, you're you've been that passionate and that creative, and you know, that's been you know your identity and your life. I wasn't, I was not surprised that he came back at all. He's a great learning tree to have around. You know, uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt, Kurt Axel is you know benefiting from having a Paul Heyman. I, I mean, it, it can't hurt. But, uh, you know, am I, was I shocked that he, he went back? Absolutely not. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about um, Paul Heyman, just because recently there's been a lot of negative reactions on online, shocking, I know, but uh, about TNA, um, about various, yeah. various things that have gone on. And I remember that uh, Paul Heyman had done an interview about a year and a half ago where he had mentioned that Dixie Carter um, was going to bring him in. Uh, to be in the creative team or to or to head up creative and TNA, and his I, I, Paul had said that if he was going to come in, his one thing was he wanted to sack everybody over forty bar one. Um, yeah. And Dixie obviously yeah. didn't take him up on that offer. Do you think now? I mean, because you worked with Paul Heyman, and th- there's so many different opinions on him. Some say, oh, you know, he's a bad businessman, or some say genius and different things. Do you think that Dixie Carter did miss the boat by not bringing him in? And do you think TNA would, if, if Paul had gone there, do you think TNA would be drastically different to what we're seeing now? I think I think she did miss the boat. Put it this way, you know, uh, look at who they brought in. I mean, TNA. That's the, that's the frustrating thing about TNA. You know, I you know I, I I I've made my jokes about them. And it's not never directly directed to the wrestlers. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I love the wrestlers in TNA. I have a lot of friends there. But I get so mad the way it's run because they had a golden opportunity to be direct competition for Vince. And instead of trying to be in the first TNA, they tried to be the next WWE. They could have had an opportunity with Paul Lee because 
Look at it this way. WCW and ECW went out of business. WCW went out of business because of bad booking. And with the bad booking and the overpaying for talent, you know, they went out of business. You know, people stopped watching. You know, people stopped attending their shows. ECW just went out of business because of bad bookkeeping, of trying to keep, you know, overpaying people to, you know, try to prevent them from going to WWE and ECW, and along with a bad TV deal. Um, so you, you, you could have potentially had, instead of, you could have potentially brought in the people who killed WCW, or you could have brought in the guy who, you know, revolutionized the wrestling business. You know, if, if ECW had TNA's backing, there's no, there's countless, I mean, not only would it still be in business, but it would be, you know, direct competition with Vince. It could have been. You know, Paulie would have had the money to keep the talent, do creative business. That's why, that's the bummer about ECW going out of the business the way it did. You know, especially today you look at, like, YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. You know, at, at this point in the career of ECW was still around, they wouldn't have had to get TV. They could have just got their own YouTube channel and, sold their own ads and put it on, you know, in between the, you know, you know, put their own commercials on the YouTube channel and, you know, everybody around the world could have watched it, you know, and mm-hmm. then everybody around the world could have bought, you know, the ECW merchandise and stuff like that. So that's the frustrating thing about, you know, TNA. They could have been the next big thing, but instead of trying to be original, I mean, they, I mean, even recently, you know, with, you know, Stephanie coming back, so what's TNA do? Dixie Carter comes out and she's the lead female heel in TNA. It's like Jesus Christ. If they had a if, if TNA had a creative thought, it died of loneliness. I mean, <laughs> it just. I swear to God, it's so frustrating. Yeah. And and, yes. and, and I think and the, and the thing that sucks is I think Dix, Dixie knows it too. You know that she she, she had something good, but and it could be better, but. There's also people in that front office, you know, from people I know that say, you know, they, they don't know wrestling. They know maybe, like, country music and all this shit, but they don't know wrestling. You know, TNA came to Philadelphia, and they ran the Tower Theater. And when I first heard that, I went, why the hell are they running the Tower Theater? If you ever see the Tower Theater, it's mainly a concert venue, and it's on a, a slant that goes down to the stage. And all the seats are bolted to the floor. I'm like, where the fuck are they going to put the ring? Well, they put the ring on the stage. Talk about this being awkward. I mean, and it's being not only for being a fan, but, you know, for being a wrestler, you know, playing to one side of the ring. And then, you know, it, it, it drew so poor. Nobody knew TNA was coming to town. So it drew so poorly that they sold tickets for the floor and the balcony because there's a balcony there. And before the show started, they said, and they asked everybody to please come from the balcony on the, and throw out the seats on the floor. It's very sad. It's a shame. It's frustrating. And, you know, you know the, with the rumors of, you know, TNA, you know, possibly being in trouble and stuff like that, it didn't have to be that way. Yeah, it is very, very frustrating to watch sometimes. Um, it is. I think the fa- we, we were talking last week about the fact that um, Bound for Glory, as far as I'm aware, is supposed to be like their WrestleMania, like their big show of the year, and there's one advertised match, and we're eight days away, nine days away. Yeah, and the, and the funny thing is, you tell me Bound for Glory is their WrestleMania, and I really wouldn't have known if, if you hadn't told me. Bound for Glory, I mean, that sounds like a country album or something <laughs> like that. It doesn't sound like a fucking wrestling show. Bound, yeah. Bound for Glory, Bound for Disaster. <laughs> bound for ba- bound for bankruptcy. How about that? What is bound for glory? Is that where the one where they have to win matches, they get points or something like that? Yeah, it's like a four. It's like a four month Royal Rumble. Oh great! I want to do math while I'm watching wrestling. You know, I just who wants to do math? I just want to. I just want to get my frustrations out and go. That guy's the bad guy. That guy's the good guy. I want to see that good guy beat the guy. I don't want to do fucking math. I don't. I don't want to do stats while I'm watching my wrestling. I don't want to think. I just want to react. I have to go, oh, this guy needs just that many points. Uh, fuck you. Give me some wrestling. 
But anyway, back to um, you were talking about uh, Paul Heyman and, and the fact that ECW went out of business, and that kind of brought me to something I wanted to talk to you about is you were part of the Barbed Wire City documentary that came out earlier yes, on this sir. year. One of but, the uh, one of the most one of the bits of the film that I really felt a little bit of emotion with that I didn't expect was uh, the two fans in particular, the Straw Hat fan, and then the guy who. Oh, I'm gonna try, I have to try and describe him because I don't remember his name, but the kind of the uh, African American guy he had the baseball cap on, and he stopped watching Tony wrestling after ECW. Tony Lewis. Yeah, yeah, and he Tony. when he came back and the the they interviewed him, and he he was talking about when he went to like I think it was the cloakroom or something, and it was the same woman that was there when he went to ECW, and you know he st- he started getting a little bit choked up, and you were like, wow, you know this is. This is what this meant to people. That was people. That was something people had to look forward to two or three times a month for what eight years. You know, was just, you know, within those eight years, people counted on ECW as their form of escapism. Yeah, you know, Tony Lewis, man, he really did a lot for ECW. Um, in my uh, instance, I was in the WWE. And it was right after WrestleMania 15, and uh, we did a tour overseas, and then when we came back from the uh, overseas tour, uh, we're doing a, a, a I want to say a Sunday night heat, and they notified me that they were giving me my release, you know, and I just went from like one of the best feelings of my life of being on a WrestleMania in my hometown, Philadelphia, to suddenly thinking I'm going to be out of work, and like the Tony Lewis and the strictly ECW guys took all their resources and started up a campaign called Save the Meanie. They called East, uh, they called WWE headquarters. They emailed WWE headquarters, and uh, they just you know started a, a letter writing campaign to get me my job back in WWE. And uh, one day I'm at home, I get a phone call. It's Jim Ross, and he says, uh, "It looks like you got a reprieve from the governor." <laughs> And, uh, you know, uh, you got your job back. I was like, that's awesome. And I went to the next TVs, and then Trusso pulled me aside and said, yeah, man, uh, as soon as word got, you know, got out that you're you fired, our email system had become inundated with emails, you know, specifically for you. And, you know, he went to, and then Trusso went to Vince McMahon with it saying, hey, man, I think we need to give this, another guy, this guy another chance. As well, you know, and some of the other workers did, you know, from what I was told, you know, I, I was told, like, you know, Sean Waltman and uh, somebody even said Triple H or The Rock even, you know. And, and it sounds goofy, like the Blue Me saying Triple H and The Rock went to bat for me. But, you know, from what I was told, they went and said, hey, man, the guy's only been here for a few months. Why don't you give him a chance, you know? and But, you know, it might have gone, you know, I, I, I credit a lot of that to Tony Lewis and the uh, Strictly ECW movement. But one of the other things I wanted to ask you about was, I know that you had done an interview a couple of years ago, and you had mentioned that CM Punk in 2011 had kind of made you start watching again and become yeah. a fan again. And I think a lot of people kind of felt that way at the time. And how, how do you feel now, we're a couple of years on, 2013, in terms of watching wrestling and stuff, do, do you still watch it? Is there anything that you're enjoying right now in wrestling? Uh, I still watch. Uh, like when, uh, like before the whole, like when, the, like there's a period where I just didn't watch, and then uh, the one night Twitter and Facebook just went ballistic about the CM Punk promo, the uh, infamous promo that he did. And uh, I said, oh, well, let me see what this is all about. And I went and watched it. I was like, man, that was really good. Whether, it, I mean, people want to debate whether it's a shoot or a scripted or not. Forget all that. Fuck that. Don't worry about that. It was good. It was entertaining. You know, people are, people try to watch wrestling like they're dissecting the, uh, the Zupruder film or uh, in a fashion that, uh, you know, like the fucking, uh, what's that movie? Um, the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> pro, pro wrestling is not the fucking Da Vinci Code. Stop trying to overanalyze it. You know, stop trying to fucking, 
figure out what makes it work, what doesn't make it work. Just watch it. That's you know? got, that's got to be a t-shirt soon. If I don't see a t-shirt saying pro wrestling is not the fucking Da Vinci Code, like that would be, yeah. I, I'd buy it. Uh, Maybe I'll put that up on my uh, my t-shirt store at uh, prowrestlingtees.com slash that, blue meanie. That along, with, uh, that along with bound for bankruptcy as well. Dude, <laughs> Dude but uh, seriously, uh, did you ever see that movie Almost Famous? Yes, yes. There's a scene where the kid, you know, gets the job with Rolling Stone magazine. He's going to go on tour with Stillwater, and he's, he's covering his first concert, and he's standing there, and his band starts playing, and the kid whips out his notebook, and he's, he's going to write down the set list, and the girl, Penny Lane, takes his notebook and his pen and makes him put it down and just makes him watch the show. Just enjoy the show. That's the way pro wrestling should be. You know, instead of sitting by your keyboard feverishly waiting to write what you love and hate about the wrestling business, why don't you just sit there on your couch and just watch it? You know, uh, you know, everybody wants to, you know, be, you know, a court stenographer and do a play-by-play on, you know, their Facebook account, hoping that WWE.com might happen to stumble upon their Facebook page and go, you know what? I love the way you dictated uh, the show I just watched. <laughs> you know, reading your Facebook page is almost just like watching the show that I just watched. I am so glad that you typed out the entire show that I just watched that I could go and read on your page. It's like, you know, after, you know, the old, you'd watch a talk show back in the day like Donahue. For transcripts of the show, write to Burrell, care of the Phil <laughs> Donahue show. You know, these people, they want to do play-by-play on their fucking Facebook page or in their Twitter feed. and I mean, it's going to be exciting when we we'll talk about it and stuff like that, but some people are think they're going to be the next fucking uh, Vic Venom. I don't know, man. It's just... My, my favorite is when, like, um, you know, like the big show uh, knocked out Triple H. And some, yes. and some, and you know that is like, I mean, Stevie Wonder could see that coming, right? But right. you'll still have someone on Twitter going, "I called it, I booked it," and you're like, "Well, so did everyone else who watches." The yeah, show, you know, but but they'll still make out as if uh, they they are Vince McMahon's next golden boy in the creative team. Oh, great! You called it, so uh, what you get out of it? Oh, nothing. Okay, cool. Shut up. <laughs> you know, just. I'm not saying for people not to be fans, but people try to put themselves over as if they're in the business. And they, as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not. And before people think I'm, you know, making a blanket statement about all fans, I'm just saying certain sectors yeah. of the, uh, the the wrestling world. And it's just like Jesus Christ, just be a fan. I, I, you don't want to be like one of those guys where where you got to say you don't understand it unless you've done it. You know, kind of thing, but there's certain there's certain reasons why things are done. Like a lot of people are pissed about you know the finish of the last pay per view, and in a, in a lot of ways they're right. You know, I mean, like the argument is you know you gave another non finish on the pay per view where you're charging fans fifty dollars or fifty five dollars to watch the pay per view. Some people argue, you know, it was rotten of them to do a non-finish on the pay-per-view. And then you get the, the other people who argue, but they're trying to further a storyline. I could perp- you know, you know, see both sides perfectly clear. And I would say, if you're trying to further a storyline, you can still do the non-finish, but don't do it on the pay-per-view. It's funny because I, I, once the pay-per-view had finished, I was kind of thinking to myself, even if they had put the six-man tag as the main event, would have been a good idea. You know, to kind of have a finish on the, in the last match, you know, if you're going to book a non-finish, put that halfway through. I mean, I, I know I'm suddenly becoming an armchair booker, but um, you know what I mean. It's, no, uh, no, no, no. In, in that case, you know, a booker, a good booker, would say, okay, we're going to have a non-finish. Make it, you know, to make it like a semi-main event, where it's not the last match on the show, but I don't know how many matches on the show. That, like, say they had nine matches. Mm-hmm. Instead of making it a ninth match, make it the seventh match. You know, and then you can have one match, you know, the you know, after that and then a match to, you know, send people home happy with, you know, to finish off the pay per view, you know? Yeah. I'll but uh that. still you don't wanna you don't want people paying, you know, fifty five dollars and just you know, 
doing something that you could have just done the next night on Raw. You know, it's just, I mean, look at how many how many WrestleManias have there been where the the night after Raw has been better than the actual WrestleMania. Well, why couldn't you just done that at WrestleMania? <laughs> you know, you know why why couldn't you just do that stuff? You know. You know, why, why don't you just do a, like a, a mind trick and, you know, okay, everything we're going to do for, you know, the wall after WrestleMania, we'll just do for WrestleMania. You've, uh, you've, you've given us so much of your time tonight, which I really appreciate. And just to kind of finish things off, what are you, what are you kind of getting up to now? I know you mentioned that you were doing some stuff with the Monster Factory. If people want to uh, check it out, uh, I just pulled up the website. This is monsterfactory.org. If people want to check yes, them out, and uh, yeah, so I mean, it's awesome that you're kind of giving back now and, and helping. Uh, I guess the next generation of guys coming along, and yeah, definitely go to monsterfactory.org. Uh, if you you follow, if you're on Twitter, go to at for the number four monster factory. They tried to get the monster factory, but I guess there's a line of uh, uh, horror movie. There's a horror movie <laughs> company that has. The Monster Factory. But if you're on Twitter, go to the at the number four Monster Factory, uh, and you can find the Monster Factory on Facebook. Just do a search for Monster Factory, and they'll come right up and follow them. And uh, you know they try to do they do shows every two weeks. Uh, we're going to try to do stuff where we do more like shows for you know online and stuff like that, so you can get to see some of the. The, you know the, the kids that are you know coming up through the school and see how they're progressing and stuff like that. Well, we um, tonight's been brilliant. There's been some great stories. I hope you've enjoyed yourself coming back on the show. Of course, man. Of course. You know, I'm just sitting here uh, in a uh, in the mini office and the uh, just you know just, you know shooting the shit, man. I, I don't mind doing this. I mean, uh, and it's also a credit, you know, that you. I think you have a very good show and you do a very good interview and, uh, you know, uh, you know, sometimes you get a show and the first interview is, it just sounds like somebody's, you know, in their basement and just, you know, doing a show to themselves, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah, you're part of their, uh, you know, fantasy, whatever show, but yeah, I mean, your, your show is very good. I've, I mean, I, I've listened, you know, even for the times I weren't on, I enjoyed it. The interviews you've done with like Axel Rott and, and and John Philip Havage and stuff like that and uh, yeah it's a good show and it, I I I like you know getting to talk to you know my overseas friends and stuff like that overseas fans and it's kind of I, I I'm bummed I I haven't been over there in a while so you know just to uh, you know reach out and you know just still be active and I'm flattered that people still want to hear from me so. Uh, you know, I haven't been on TV since, you know, well, national TV since 2005, uh, you know, if you know, for the WWE as far as wrestling is concerned. Uh, I mean, I, I did a, you know, a, a thing on TNA, but who knows who saw that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, <laughs> and, oh. but in, uh, whatchamacallit, I'm, I'm just flattered anybody is interested in what I have to say or to see what I have to do because just like you I'm, I'm still a fan of the business <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show man uh, my pleasure and uh, thanks for everybody for listening and thanks for having me